In our last session, we finished up the book of Nehemiah, and with it, the entirety of the Old Testament. It's taken us about 333 hours to get through all of that, and we still have the entirety of the New Testament to finish before we're done with our journey through all of God's inspired word. But I want to spend a little bit of time of that transition era between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. It's a roughly 400-year period, sometimes referred to as the silent years, but it's actually not all that silent. It's only silent when looking at the inspired writings that we have. We do have uh, words of history from people like uh, Josephus, and so we'll be looking at his antiquities of the Jews in particular. Uh, he was a first century Jewish priest, uh, a Pharisee, and a historian, and we depend heavily upon his uh, writings to understand what happened. Uh, we also have a couple of uninspired uh, but anonymous uh, Jewish writings that are from a time period shortly after the events uh, that we call the Maccabean uh, Rebellion or the Maccabean uh, uh, Revolt of the second century BC. These are the book of First Maccabees and the book of Second Maccabees. Now, they're not actually sequential, even though they kind of sound like that. First Maccabees has uh, a, a good, uh, good, solid treatment of the f history of the Jewish people in the first and the second century BC. Second Maccabees has uh, some of the same information, but it kind of drills in on the religious things uh, that were being dealt with in that time period. And so you'll hear me referencing. Uh, some of our material from there as well. Uh, for today, though, I would uh, encourage you uh, to find a copy of Josephus's Antiquities, book number 11, chapter number 7, uh, is the area that I am going to be referencing as I begin today. Because we, we know that Nehemiah served uh, during the time of Artaxerxes, uh, who died in 424 BC. So the last events in the book of Nehemiah take place in the 420s BC. We are now going to zoom ahead about 90 or so years to 336 BC, and the the ascension of the final king of the Persian Empire. His name is Darius III, and he's 40 years old. Now, he has the name Darius, but he's not the same Darius as in the book of Nehemiah, because like I said, we've gone about 100 years forward in time. Uh, Darius, once he becomes king appoints a man by the name of Sanballat to be the Persian ruler of the region of Samaria, just to the north of Judea. Now, this is also problematic for us because we know we had a guy in the book of Nehemiah named Sanballat, and he was ruling in the area just north of Judea in the area we call Samaria. Not the same guy, obviously, because we've jumped ahead 100 years, uh, but uh, it can cause confusion if you're not aware of it. So just watch out for that. Now, here's the issue that comes up. When Sembalat arrives in Samaria, he reaches out and starts making alliances with other powerful persons in the region. He marries his daughter to the brother of the high priest of the Judeans, a man by the name of Manasseh. And this becomes a flashpoint of trouble 
for the Jewish people that we'll come back to momentarily. So that's all happening in 336 BC. Now something else happens in October of that same year that is of importance. Philip II of Macedon was assassinated at a town not very far from Berea in Macedonia. Now, why is that important? Because once he's dead, his son Alexander, a 20-year-old, becomes the new king of Macedon. And this Alexander is known to us as Alexander the Great. So that's all happening in 336 BC. Now, the following year, 335 BC, the Jews begin complaining to the high priest that his brother Manasseh shouldn't be a priest anymore because he's married to a non-Jewish person. Now, you might remember that was part of the problem in the years of Ezra and Nehemiah, just a hundred years previous. And their solution was, you either divorce your non-believing wife, your non-believing spouse, or you're out. You are no longer Jewish. So when Manasseh is confronted with this choice, he goes up to Samaria and speaks to his father-in-law, Sambalat, and says, I love your daughter, but I love being a priest more. So I'm going to have to divorce her in order to remain a Jewish priest. Well, Sanballat decides to offer him an alternative solution. He says, look, I want you to stay married to my daughter. Just come up here and be a priest. I will speak to King uh, Darius of the Persian Empire, and I will get permission from him to declare you the priest of Samaria. And we will build you a temple on Mount Gerizim near Shechem, uh, just like the temple that you've been serving at uh, on uh, the Temple Mount down in Jerusalem. Does that, is that a reasonable solution to you? And of course, Manasseh loves that idea uh, because then he'd be the high priest of the Samaritan religion. Well, it just so happens that there were a bunch of other priests that didn't like what was being done to Manasseh, his forcing, uh, being forced out of uh, the priesthood uh, because he'd married a non-Jewish uh, woman. And so they leave at the same time, and they go to Samaria, uh, to Mount Gerizim, and they become priests along with him. And so what we see here is the beginning of the Samaritan religion that we see in the New Testament uh, several hundred years later. And over time, uh, as Josephus tells us, any Jewish priest or Levite that runs into trouble at Jerusalem and feels that they can't resolve it, they abandon Jerusalem uh, for service at Samaria or at Shechem at Mount Gerizim. So the Samaritan religion looks very much like the Jewish religion with some tweaks to it. Uh, one of the big tweaks is that uh, while uh, the Jewish scripture specifically identifies Jerusalem as the place that God says my name will dwell and the place where the temple is supposed to be uh, built, the Samaritan scriptures say that Mount Gerizim is the place that God says his name is going to dwell and the place where the temple is going to be built. Uh, other than that, everything else is pretty much the same uh, between the two religions, uh, which will help you understand uh, the uh, interaction between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. In the following year, 334 B.C., 
Alexander crosses the Hellespont, uh, that little land bridge between uh, Europe and Asia proper. Uh, It's where Istanbul is today. And when he did that, he was invading the Persian Empire and starting a war. Uh, The following year, 333 B.C., he had his first big engagement with the Persian king himself, Darius III, and he defeats him at this Battle of Issus. Uh, That's in November of 333 B.C., And it becomes obvious at that point that the Persian Empire is going to be overwhelmed by the invading Greeks or the invading Macedonians, which then feeds into what happens the following year, 332 B.C. A couple of things. Uh, Alexander starts heading south into the area of the Persian Empire where the Jewish people and the Samaritan people live. So into the Promised Land area. He, <clears throat> excuse me, he starts um, his siege of the city of Tyre. From Tyre, he sends out uh, declarations to all the peoples of the lower Middle East, you need to throw your allegiance behind me. Accept me as the new king of this area. Send me support. Send me supplies. Send me soldiers. When the Jewish high priest received that communication from Alexander, he sent back a very polite letter saying, I am sorry, but we have already made an oath in the name of God to King Darius that we will not support anyone that he's fighting against. And so we are bound by our divine oath not to provide you any supplies. Now, Alexander was incensed by this this denial of support from the Jewish people, particularly from the high priest. And he decided that once he had uh, taken care of Tyre uh, and had taken care of Gaza, which was next on his hit list, that he would then go up and do the same thing to Jerusalem. So now keep that in the back of your mind. That's what's on his schedule in 332 BC. Now, when the Samaritans got the message from Alexander, they responded by coming to him in a delegation. Sanballat, the leader, came to him with a big delegation of soldiers and said, we agree. We are going to no longer serve Darius We're going to serve you. We're going to become your soldiers. We're going to become your supporters. Would you please do the following thing for us? Would you please acknowledge that Manasseh is the high priest of the Samaritans? And will you give us permission to completely build this temple at Uh, Shechem, on the Mount of Gerizim, where Manasseh can serve as the high priest. And, of course, uh, he agreed to these conditions. And so that's how the Samaritan Temple was built with the permission of Alexander the Great. And uh, Sanballat died not too long after making that alliance. And so he kind of is just taken out of the picture and we're left with pretty much the Samaritan religion being the thing that we'll be concerned on uh, from all from here on out. Now, after seven months of siege of Tyre and two months of siege against Gaza, 
Alexander is finished and decides that he's going to take on the Jewish people, uh, as he said he would, because they wouldn't help him out. Uh, At this point, I'm in uh, the book of Antiquities. It's uh, book number 11, and I believe uh, we are in, uh, let's see, which one is this? Chapter number 8, and uh, we are in subsection uh, number 4. And it says this, that he made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And Yadua the high priest, when he heard that, was in agony. He was under terror as not knowing how he should meet the Macedonians, since the king was displeased at his foregoing disobedience. And he therefore ordained that the people should make supplications and should join him uh, in offering sacrifices to God, whom he besought to protect that nation and to deliver them from the perils that were coming upon them. So the high priest basically calls a great big worship and prayer session at the Jerusalem temple, asking God to intervene to save them from Alexander the Great, who's been steamrollering over all of the Persian Empire. They don't, they don't have any hope whatsoever to hold out against him in the physical world. Here's the rest of what uh, Jose- uh, Josephus says. Whereupon God warned him, that is the high priest, in a dream, which came upon him after he'd offered the sacrifice, that he should take courage and adorn the city, that is, decorate it, and open the gates, and that the rest should appear in white garments, and that he and the priest should meet the king in the habits, that is, the clothing or uniforms proper to their order, without the dread of any ill consequences which the providence of God would prevent, and upon which he arose from his sleep, greatly rejoiced, and declared to all the warning that he'd received from God, according to which dream he acted entirely, and he waited for the coming of the king. So Jerusalem, instead of being locked up tight against the advancing Macedonian army, uh, it opened its gates, it decorated the place in welcome of Alexander, and the high priest uh, was dressed up in his his festival uniform, uh, and his plan was to go out and welcome Alexander to the city and let God deal with it. Verse, excuse me, uh, it's subsection number five now that I've moved to. When he understood that he was not far from the city, he, that is, when the high priest realized that Alexander was close, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of the citizens. The procession was venerable, and the manner of it different from that of other nations. He reached to the place called Sapha, which name translated into Greek signifies a prospect for you from thence, a prospect both of the temple and of Jerusalem. Uh, Now, this is a little bit weird um, from its logistics uh, because the last place that uh, Alexander was at was at Gaza, which is southwest of Jerusalem. But but apparently, uh, he doesn't approach Jerusalem from the southwest. Instead, uh, Alexander goes up the coast and then across uh, to the central spine of uh, Israel, uh, and he starts approaching Jerusalem from the north. It's possible that he went to Shechem first to perhaps dedicate uh, the temple of the Samaritans. That's a guess that we have in mind here. But he's approaching from the north, and uh, the road that comes from the north, there is just off to the east, uh, immediately to the northeast of the Temple Mount, a high point. It's actually the, the, it's part of the Mount of Olives, 
uh, just on the northern part of the Mount of Olives, and it's higher uh, than the, uh, the southern part of the Mount of Olives. It's called uh, Mount Scopus today. And uh, there's a hospital up there, and there's a university up there nowadays. Uh, our last trip to Israel, uh, we actually stopped uh, at the site uh, of where these people were located uh, in this story. Uh, and we had a really nice view of the old city of Jerusalem from here. Uh, it's interesting that this particular place is where the Assyrians set up their overwatch camp when they took the city or tried to take the city of Jerusalem. This is where the Babylonians set up their oversight uh, whenever they took the city of Jerusalem. It's also where the Romans set up their overwatch site whenever they came against Jerusalem in their day. So it's a place that kings and uh, commanders have often set up their overwatch site when they get ready to take a city. So it appears as if the Macedonians already had a watch camp on Mount Scopus. And uh, the high priest Yadua assumed that when Alexander the Great arrived in the area, that's the first place he would go, that he would go to his overwatch camp uh, and then prepare to attack the city. So instead of um, a, um, a defensive force coming out to meet the Macedonians, a celebratory force meets them at Mount Scopus. Let's go back and read some more uh, from uh, the text of Antiquities 11. When the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that followed Alexander thought that they should have liberty to plunder the city, uh, so it's an alliance of the other places that have joined with Alexander at this point, they think that, yeah, boy, there's going to be some good goodies we get uh, once uh, this city is taken out. Uh, instead of getting that, uh, nor uh, were they going to get this, to torment the high priest to death because they thought that he'd insulted Alexander by refusing to support him, uh, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse of it happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen, and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing with his meter or his hat, uh, his turban on his head, having the golden plate on which the name of God was engraved. So we have to picture the high priest in his special uniform, which included this golden plate with the raised name of God on it in letters, uh, Kodesh le Yahweh, holy to he who is. That's what Alexander sees as he gets close to this entourage. And this is what he did. It says, he approached all by himself and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. The Jews also did it all together with one voice. They saluted Alexander and they encompassed him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done, and they supposed him disordered in his mind. So these guys were shocked that Alexander went up, and not only did he say hello in politeness to the high priest, he actually apparently bowed down in front of him. And this was totally the opposite of what they expected. They expected him to execute this guy after um, torturing him for refusing to support. <coughs> Excuse me. So at this point, one of the members of Alexander's entourage comes up to him and he asked him how it came to pass that when all the others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews, to whom he replied, I didn't adore him, but that God whom hath 
honored him with the high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream, in that very dressing, when I was at Dios in Macedonia, who when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly to pass over the sea thither, uh, from, uh, for that he would conduct my army and would give me dominion over the Persians." Whence it is that having seen no other person in that dress and now seeing this person in it, remembering that vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under the divine conduct and shall therewith conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians and that all will succeed according to uh, what has come to my own mind. So this is what I was telling you was coming up that the high priest, because he was obedient, apparently to this vision that he had the night before, the dream that he had the night before, he actually looked exactly like a dream that Alexander was apparently given by God a couple of years earlier, back in Macedonia, when God apparently told him, I want you to take your army and take down the Persian Empire. Now, this is not all that hard to believe that this is accurate history because we know that the book of Daniel describes the coming of Alexander the Great in a couple of different ways, that he and his Macedonians were going to be the next empire to come to the region. So as we continue this study, uh, I want you to appreciate how God protects the Jewish people as the transition happens between the Persian Empire into the Greek Empire and how the Jewish faith ends up being protected in that transition too because God is in control at all times.